above the hour and we are coming on the air with a big question out of these newly obtained videos from Georgia. Why is a local Republican official leading a pair of Trump operatives into an election office on the same day of an alleged voting machine breach? And why are well-known election deniers also visiting? We're live in Atlanta to ask these questions to our team who just got their hands on the videos. Plus, new details from Homeland Security warning now about a possible cyber attack or attacks against schools nationwide, just as kids are only now getting back to class. And guess what? Fat Leonard is on the run. Authorities are now looking for a man guilty of massive corruption in that Navy scandal that we've talked about. He cut off his GPS monitoring bracelet. The U.S. Marshals say the escape was not a spur-of-the-moment decision. Plus, a groundbreaking settlement with the e-cigarette company Juul. It now will have to pay $438 million after being accused of misleading young people about health risks in ads. But is that enough? And millions in China are getting fed up with the country's strict COVID lockdowns after a deadly earthquake kept them from seeking shelter. We're going to be live in Beijing later in the show. Good day. I'm Tom Costello in for Halley, and we are now seeing new video that's giving us more insight into the alleged fake elector scheme by members of former President Trump's inner circle in a small rural county in Georgia. This video shows a local Republican Party official leading two Trump operatives into a county election office on the same day that a voting system was breached and just one day after the Capitol attack. The woman in the blue shawl there, she's accused of signing a fake certificate to try to overturn the Georgia election results. The two men have admitted to gaining access to a voting machine, though not necessarily this one. Now, these men claim the former president's lawyer, Sidney Powell, asked them to breach the machine. We're also getting video of these two men arriving at the same elections office a couple of weeks later. Those men are accused of pursuing voting machines in Michigan as well. Meanwhile, we're waiting for the Justice Department to make a decision on whether it will appeal the special master given to former President Trump, that independent third party who would look over the documents seized in Mar-a-Lago. But that does not mean the FBI's investigation is on ice. We now know from a senior DOJ official that the DOJ can still look into the classified documents taken from Mr. Trump's Florida home back in January and in June, just not the documents from August, at least for now. All of this as Trump's 2016 Democratic opponent, Hillary Clinton, is accusing him of breaking the law in a new interview. I would not be honest if I didn't say I think there was a seditious conspiracy against the government of the United States, and that's a crime. Led and by Donald Trump. Led by Donald Trump, encouraged by Donald Trump. So there is a lot happening, and NBC's Blaine Alexander is at the Fulton County Courthouse in, uh, in Georgia. Have you had any time to breathe, first of all, today, Blaine? Let's walk through these videos one by one. Why are they important, starting with that woman, Kathy Latham? Why is she important to Georgia investigators? Well, to answer your first question, Tom, very little time to breathe, but certainly a lot to dive into, and we have gotten a chance to do all of that. So let's start with Kathy Latham. As you mentioned, she was an official. She was actually the chair of the Coffee County GOP back when this took place. Also notably, for the background where I'm standing, the Fulton County Courthouse, the investigation, she is one of those 16 so-called fake electors that have been notified by the DA here in Fulton County that they are targets of the investigation. So as it relates to, to this and why she's of note to investigators, she is likely somebody who uh, the DA is going to be further interested in. We already know that the DA has interest uh, when it comes to Coffee County. She's issued subpoenas for information down there from that county. She's also issued a subpoena for Latham herself as one of those 16 electors, but it's very likely that she's going to be looking at this video itself specifically. But in the larger sense, when we talk about these several videos that have come out today, Tom, really what this does is this kind of gives some insight into the level of coordination, the extent to which there were actions taken essentially to overturn the election results here in Georgia. Now, I do want to point out that we actually reached out to an attorney for Latham. He did not get back to us, but he told the Washington Post in a statement that she would not knowingly and has not knowingly been involved in any sort of impropriety in the election. And that company, the, the representatives from that data company, also previously told the Post that they're confident they did nothing wrong. Tom. 
Okay, let's talk about the, the two men the other in the other video, Jeff Lindbergh and Doug Logan. They're also being pursued by Michigan's attorney general, right? And Logan has been in trouble in Arizona where he led the security firm Cyber Ninjas, right? Talk us through this. Absolutely. So let's start in Michigan. Yes, the attorney general is looking into that. In fact, directing prosecutor to kind of decide if charges are appropriate in that case. And then in Arizona, they led this kind of so-called audit of the ballots there. But this is something, you know, when we're, we're talking about these separate videos, again, this really kind of shows the degree to which there was a lot of attention placed on Coffee County, that there were several different groups of people who went inside into the elections office. And we do need to point out this surveillance video only shows the front door, doesn't show what happened inside. Side, but it does show the entrances, the exits, and we know that they spent several hours inside uh, when they went there. And as for these two individuals, there were multiple visits uh, to that elections office, Tom. I think you've kind of addressed it, but real quickly, where do these videos fit into the broader picture of there of, of this investigation? You know, Fulton County DA, uh, Fonnie Willis, is looking into any sort of uh, cooperation, any sort of coordination to overturn the election results here in Georgia. So these would fit very closely in because, again, it highlights uh, potential coordination. So, you know, she, of course, is looking as how it stems from former President Trump. And she's told me that she's looking to talk to anybody who had knowledge, who had information, who was working in coordination or at the direction of the Trump campaign. And so it's very likely that these videos would be of great interest to her, Tom. Blaine Alexander in Georgia. Thank you, Blaine. Let's turn now to the West, where a new wildfire is spreading rapidly in Southern California. A day after we told you about two fires up north, at least two people have died in the Fairview fire. That's about 90 miles from L.A. It's only 5% contained, and in just 24 hours has grown to more than 2,400 acres. California is also bracing for power outages with a flex alert issued by power operators on the seventh straight evening. Now, they're asking people to keep their thermostat at 78 degrees, despite triple-digit temps there, turn off unnecessary lights, and avoid using big appliances. It's not just hot, it is dry. Look at this map. The redder the state, the more intense the drought conditions. And the drought is hurting your wallet, even though the price of fresh veggies up 8% since last year, the volume is down 4%. So higher prices for fewer veggies. Uh, other products are getting hit hard, too. Citrus, fruit, rice, almonds. Steve Patterson is in Los Angeles braving the heat. Uh, Steve, let's start with those fires. Just when is Cal Fire, uh, what is it looking like? When, when they're starting to contain these flames up north, what's it looking like, looking like down south? Yeah, it's like this terrible game of whack-a-mole all over the state. I mean, there's something like 4,400 firefighters right now as we speak battling 14 major wildfires. And when I say major, I mean major because if you include all the brush fires that have been burning or sparking up since Sunday, you'd be talking about dozens more on top of that. It is because of what you just laid out. It's incredibly, incredibly hot. I mean, it's incredibly hot standing right here, but I'm not even in the hottest spot. It's a something like a high of 114 in Sacramento, 116 in parts of the Bay Area. When you have that kind of heat, you know, 110 at some of these wildfire sites that you're yeah. looking at right now, when you have that kind of heat, including the mega drought, including the wind, it's the recipe that we're seeing, and it's the reason why these fires are sparking up all over the place. Still 3,500 in that fire displaced from their homes uh, as we speak, Tom. It's still a dangerous situation all over the state. My God, 116 in the Bay Area? Goodness gracious. Now, California so far has avoided the blackouts, but now they're using temporary emergency power generators for the really the first time since they were installed last year, right? Are people following the, the lower energy consumption rules right now? Yeah, they are. Um, and, you know, thank God for those generators. Thankfully, people are following the rules. During the, those flex alerts that you laid out there on your screen, 4 to 9 or 10 p.m., you're supposed to conserve as much energy as possible. People are doing that. Uh, the Cal ISO, in fact, said over the last few days they've saved about 10 percent of the total energy, you know, toward this energy calculus that they're trying to avoid these rolling blackouts. But the problem is when you have 114 degree, 116 degree, 115 degree temperatures all across the state, 
that doesn't matter. Those generators is not enough. People saving, as, as good as it is that they're saving the amount that they are, it's still not enough. The ISO said people would have to save two to three times more, uh, especially on a day t t like today when we may be well over 50,000 megawatts. On a good, hot summer day, the state uses something like 30,000 megawatts. If we go over 51, that's territory that California has never been in in its entire history, and that would mean something like turning off the power in places across the state, which would, of mm. course, be very dangerous. Uh, can we talk about the impact on agriculture? Because farmers yep. have to make tough choices in the drought, right? Which crops are they going to water? So talk to us now about how they're, I guess, just picking and choosing which crops they're going to grow. Yeah, it's a very unfortunate situation. The biggest losers in this entire drought situation has to be the agriculture industry, the farming industry, you know, particularly here in, in California. I went to Central California, the breadbasket of the country. You're talking about tomatoes and rice and corn and wheat. All of that stuff is a really hard decision because you, you don't have enough water to water the crops. So you were leaving fields, whole fields fallow. One farmer I visited had a 640-acre field farm, uh, half of it was left fallow. It means he didn't grow because he couldn't grow. And so now a lot of these farmers are going to higher yield crops, but those take more water. It's a vicious cycle, Tom. Yeah. NBC Steve Patterson in L.A. Thank you, Steve. Uh, tonight yeah. we are hearing from the family of the Tennessee jogger after police announced earlier today that she had been found dead. In a statement, Eliza Fletcher's family writes that they are devastated by the senseless loss and that they are grateful to authorities for their tireless efforts to find Liza. Investigators told reporters earlier today that there is no reason to believe her death was anything other than a random attack by a stranger. Yesterday, police charged Cleotha Abstin, who you see on your screen there, with kidnapping Fletcher. He was in court today for his arraignment. Prosecutors have added charges for first-degree murder and first-degree murder while perpetrating a kidnapping. Police say Fletcher was out for an early morning jog last Friday when Abstin came up to her and forced her into an SUV. NBC's Jesse Kirsch is following all of these developments from uh, Memphis. Uh, Jesse, they found Fletcher's body last night. How and where did they find her? Can you tell her more? Tell us more about that. Yeah, Tom, quite simply, it comes down, at least in part, to a pair of sandals. According to court documents, the suspect was wearing a pair of slide sandals when he was allegedly involved in this abduction, and those sandals got left behind at the crime scene. The affidavit uh, that was filed says that those sandals were tested for DNA. The DNA matches the suspect, and that leads to his arrest. And throughout this investigation, authorities interviewed witnesses, including two people, among them the suspect's brother. And in this affidavit, it says that the two witnesses saw the suspect wiping down the inside of the car with floor cleaner and washing his clothes in the sink. Essentially, strange behavior. And all of this was happening about half a mile from where Eliza Fletcher was ultimately found Monday, according to police. And so they were canvassing this area, searching. We saw them repeatedly over the last few days. And finally, on Monday night, According to police, that is when they found her. The court documents that we've reviewed today say that she was found unresponsive on the ground behind an abandoned home. Uh, and Abstin, the suspect in court today, what more do we learn about what comes next for him? He'll be back in court tomorrow, Tom. You mentioned two charges among them, first-degree murder. So those charges were announced just minutes before he was set to be arraigned in court on the other related charges uh, in connection with this alleged kidnapping. Among them right there, especially aggravated kidnapping and tampering with evidence. So he was on his way into court when this, this announcement of the identification of the body came down, the announcement that there were new charges added, and so he will be back in court to face a judge in regards to those charges tomorrow. Uh, you have reported before that this suspect has gone to jail for kidnapping before. So what are the similarities to that previous case, to this case? And I think a lot of people are wondering how the heck does somebody who's already committed kidnapping get out, commit kidnapping, and then allegedly murder? Yeah, and, and we should note, he did spend time behind bars. So we have previously reported that this suspect, uh, in this case, pled guilty to a different kidnapping incident more than 20 years ago. And we have obtained more court records today, among them um, indictments from that incident more than 20 years ago. And they say that this suspect, Cleotha Abstin, kidnapped a lawyer at gunpoint 
and the suspect at that time was just 16 years old. But tonight, Tom, he is back behind bars. And the young lady is dead. Uh, Jesse, thank you. Jesse Kirsch uh, in Memphis for us. Tonight, we're also learning about a new cybersecurity and ransomware threat directed towards schools nationwide. Here's what we know right now. The FBI and Homeland Security have been investigating these threats for at about a week or so. They say the attacks are being carried out by a ransomware group called Vice Society. The alert says that schools are particularly lucrative targets because of the amount of sensitive student data in school systems. Homeland Security is warning cyber attacks may increase as the new school year gets underway and criminal ransomware groups see opportunities in school districts with limited cybersecurity resources. NBC News investigative correspondent Tom Winter is joining us now from New York. Tom, uh, what more do we know about Vice Society? Who's behind it? Well, that's something that the authorities are still trying to determine the exact origin of Vice Society. They appear to be an overseas network. There's been some private security, so this is not DHS or the FBI or CISA, which is the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, part of DHS, but other private uh, online sleuths, if you will, and people in the cybersecurity space, Tom, uh, say that they might uh, be Eastern European or, uh, or perhaps another country might be behind them, uh, namely Russia, still trying to determine that. Uh, not suggesting that this is a state-sponsored act, but this uh, kind of all came up uh, in the course of the last a week or so when the L.A. Unified School District uh, had identified themselves as being a target of a cyber attack and ransomware. And I think that's something that uh, people are going to be looking towards here, as you alluded to, as the school year begins. You know, you and I have both covered a lot of cyber attacks over the years, and CISA among them is, of course, leading the charge there. What other attacks is this group allegedly responsible for, and, and what are they looking for? Is it money? Is it data? What are they looking for? Well, it's a little bit of both. So one of the things that they do is not only do they lock down your system by uh, putting this ransomware up, in other words, pay us or you'll never get access to your files again, period, because they've been encrypted. But also, according to the information that we received today from CISA and the FBI, they initially begin by infiltrating the network, Tom, and exploiting the data. So in other words, they mm. go in, they don't just lock it down, they take all the data and make a copy of it, and then they lock it down. So that's uh, kind of a, a two-pronged attack. And obviously, the downside of that is, one, that they have potentially your child's information, uh, mm -hmm. potential information about who their parents are, their school background. Uh, but then also, they can cause, and L.A. alluded to this, a significant disruption in their uh, networks and their ability to function and operate uh, because they lock down those files. And it can make things very difficult for schools to operate, uh, which don't have enormous budgets, relatively speaking, when, when we're talking about IT budgets, yeah. uh, to operate and deal with these type of threats. We should remind the audience, CISA stands for essentially cybersecurity uh, in the United States, Cybersecurity Command. So uh, let's talk through some of the uh, tips for school districts, what they can do right now to protect their information. Right. So right now, first off, the FBI is saying, look, if you notice any sort of suspicious activity, you need to reach out to us right away. And if you can provide us with some of your, your logs, your IT logs, so the activity on your network, that can be very helpful. Because one of the things that they have identified, Tom, the type of off-the-shelf, as they call it, uh, type of methods that they're using to attack, it's a Hello Kitty ransomware and all sorts of other names. Uh, people that are in the cybersecurity field will be familiar with them that are watching us. But they know the types of signatures and the types of tools that that this group uses. They don't appear to use any sort of proprietary tools. So they're asking if you notice any sort of su suspicious activity to reach out to us. But the other thing is, Tom, all the normal precautions apply. Do you have all your latest updates? Are you using VPNs and your remote uh, systems correctly? And are you on the lookout for phishing emails? All important things they say can help protect from one of these attacks. Don't double-click on suspicious emails. Uh, Tom, thank you. Tom Winter in New York for us. To Uvalde, Texas now, where many kids are back at home after their first day of school since a gunman murdered 19 of their classmates and two teachers at Robb Elementary back in May. Uh, here the kids are leaving class just a short while ago. Classes usually start back up in August, but the school district wanted to give everybody more time to heal. And parents feeling a lot of emotions today as they prepare their kids to start school again. Well, I spoke to my kids um, the whole week, drilled them on if anything happened again, you know, try to make it out the window, run, don't scream. We're leaving everything in God's hands and hopefully it's a better blessed year for all the children. 
The school district is trying to reassure parents with new security measures. Across all seven campuses in the Uvalde School District, 33 Texas Department of Public Safety officers, state troopers, have been on site. Up to 500 cameras, eight-foot fencing have been installed around the schools, and school monitors are all around the campuses. Antonia Hilton joins us now from Flores Elementary in Uvalde. And Antonia, today must have been just so traumatic for kids and families, but perhaps also reassuring as well as they're trying to get back to some sense of normalcy. What are you hearing? Tom, I just lost you there. Antonia, can you hear us now? We will see if we can get back to Antonia. And we will endeavor that. Uh, in the meantime, we want to tell you that across the country at this hour, federal investigators are looking for a former military contractor. He's known as Fat Leonard. The feds say that he's on the run after cutting off his GPS monitoring ankle bracelet and escaping house arrest in San Diego. Now, Leonard Glenn Francis pleaded guilty to offering half a million dollars in bribes to Navy officers back in 2015. Prosecutors say he'd been under house arrest since at least 2018 and was supposed to be sentenced later this month. U.S. Marshals say it looks like Francis had been planning his escape for some time. NBC's Pentagon correspondent Courtney QB joins us now with the latest. And Courtney, remind us now about Fat Leonard's case and his relationship to the military. Well, it was the biggest corruption sc scandal in the history of the U.S. Navy, Tom. So Fat Leonard, as he became known around the military and, and since then, and as this case gained national and international recognition, he had a contracting business. He would pay a number of U.S. Navy officers, in some cases pretty senior officers, uh, with bribes, money, expensive dinners, trips, and in some cases even prostitutes, to uh, encourage them to bring their ships to the ports where he had his contracting business. So he would provide them with logistical support, gasoline, and other ways to support the ships being there. And, in, in, um, and then in response for the ships pulling in and providing him with a lot of money, he would take care of these sailors. Well, it was investigated by the, the NCIS, the Naval Criminal Investigation Services, years ago, and a number of U.S. Navy officers were found guilty of taking these bribes. Some went to jail. Many careers were ended. And I will tell you, Tom, that the ripples of the Fat Leonard scandal are literally still felt today in the promotion process for the U.S. Navy here and around the world. You know, I was reading earlier that some of the neighbors, I guess, saw U-Haul trucks have been coming and going to that house for several days at least. Do we have any idea where he may be heading and what the search process is like for somebody who escapes house arrest? By the way, he's awfully close to the Mexican border, right? One would think that's a possibility. That's exactly what U.S. officials who were speaking to are saying, that, you know, he is close to Mexico. As you said, the fact that there, the neighbors saw those U-Haul vehicles over the course of the last several weeks is what give, is giving the U.S. officials and, and military officials who I've spoken with the, the belief that he most likely had been planning something for some time. And the timing is very curious, Tom. In just a couple of weeks, he was scheduled to be sentenced for his role in this large bribery scandal with the U.S. Navy. So the belief, again, he may have planned this for some time, and he may have gotten a several days heads, uh, uh, heads up or advance on the U.S. Marshals who are searching for him now. The concern is that he was able to get potentially across the border, across state lines, before they even realized that he had cut off his ankle bracelet and that he was gone. And I'm, I'm guessing that if the caught, now he's going to face even more charges for escaping house arrest. Yeah, absolutely. So, and they, the, the, the U.S. Marshals have put out and the, the local authorities have put out a search for him. You know, the reason that he was called Fat Leonard is because he's a large guy. He weighs about 400 pounds. Uh, they've put out his description. The hope is that both the combination of these U-Haul vehicles, rented U-Haul vehicles, of course, and his unusual uh, appearance, that they'll be able to catch him if, in fact, if and when they do catch him, he will face additional charges for escaping and, and violating the terms of his house arrest. Courtney, thank you. Courtney Cuby at the, at the Pentagon. Uh, let's now go back to Antonia Hilton. We've reestablished contact. She is in uh, Uvalde, Texas, at Flores Elementary. And Antonia, you know, we talked about this. You may not have heard me. I was asking, today must have been so traumatic for kids and families. But maybe is there any reassurance at all that there is some sense of normalcy returning? Or is it just too, too, too difficult right now? 
you know, Tom, for every family, it's a little bit different. But what I can tell you is that many of them really want to try and reestablish that normalcy. And returning physically in person to these campuses is a part of that for these parents. You know, Rob Elementary, students will never return to that campus again. And even though the floor is here, you know, this is a school where this is absolutely not the site where that massacre took place. Still, you saw parents, in some cases, terrified to drive up here. We saw families mourning in their cars in some cases. And so, you know, it's going to be a step-by-step -step process. And really, it's about the relationship between the district reestablishing trust with the parents who are fearful right now. Take a listen to some of the conversations we had this morning. We're good. We're OK. We're um, scared, but we're here. We still have to keep going because our kids can't just you know, be suffocated. You know, interestingly, I had a conversation earlier today with Dr. Roy Guerrero. He is a pediatrician working with many of the victims and families here in town. And he told me that he's starting to see as school comes back more families ready to speak out, to process some of the emotions and experiences they've been going through. And so while his clinic has been busy all summer, he's seeing some new families come forward, ready to talk about their stories and try to heal as the school year begins, Tom. Yeah, uh, it's going to take years, I think. But, you know, we see all these police officers in the video there who are escorting the kids into and out of school. How long will they be around? And is there anything else the community wants to see beyond the police presence? Well, you know, I think it's important to note that some of these security measures aren't entirely in place yet. And that has upset some parents who wanted every single possible security measure to be ready for the first day. You know, you mentioned the fencing that's gone up around campuses. It's not complete everywhere. They promised 500 cameras. Not all of them are up and running yet. And so, you know, while we have 33 uh, DPS officers here on uh, campus, there are new officers who are still in some cases getting hired to work on the school's police force and they have new hallway monitors. There is more that some parents want to see, and I think that goes back to the relationship piece that I mentioned, right, that the parents are looking to the administrators to keep proving to them in these early weeks that they are taking health and safety of the kids so seriously, Tom. I've got only 30 seconds, but I'm guessing a lot of parents also are choosing homeschooling or maybe, maybe private schools if they can afford it. Uh, that may not be an option for most of those people. That's but right. What are the other options? Well, it's homeschooling, it's virtual schooling. They have a virtual academy set up for the district here. And then there's a local Catholic school that has welcomed a lot of the kids, particularly kids who were, you know, present for the shooting that day. Many of them have opted for that option because they feel like it's just not emotionally right for them to be back in this district at this time. So, you know, it goes back to that trust piece that they're trying to yeah. give the families all the options possible so that eventually they feel comfortable coming back here. Antonia, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, still ahead this hour, Elon Musk and Twitter take their battle back to the courtroom. What a judge is willing to sort out as the billionaire tries to back out of buying the social network. And breaking Bieber news, the pop superstar changing his tour plans as he recovers from Ramsey Hunt syndrome. Stay with us. And we have some breaking news from the entertainment world. Canadian pop star Justin Bieber is suspending the rest of his world tour after a health setback. In a statement on Instagram, Bieber, who's on his justice tour right now, says after he got off stage in Rio de Janeiro, the exhaustion overtook him. He realized he needed to make his health the priority. The 28-year-old revealed earlier this summer that he's dealing with Ramsey Hunt syndrome, which is a rare neurological condition that causes partial paralysis in his face. The cancellations will impact 70 shows through next March across parts of the U.S., Asia, and Europe as well. Uh, the fight between Elon Musk and Twitter is playing out in a Delaware court. Musk's lawyers now pushing to delay the October trial date at a hearing later today, a uh, hearing today rather, and Twitter accusing Musk of unreasonable demands. Twitter lawyers also say that they have had to, quote, chase and claw for every document in this case. The hearing covered Musk's request to add allegations that came from a whistleblower complaint from Twitter's former head of security. A Twitter sued Musk in July over his attempt to walk away from buying the company for $44 billion. NBC's Jake Ward joins me now. He's in Silicon Valley, I believe. Jake, talk us through this now. What stands out to you from the back and forth that we heard today? 
Well, back and forth is definitely the right uh, phrase here, Tom. This is a war in the courts that doesn't look like it's going to be ended anytime soon. Uh, as you mentioned, Twitter and Elon Musk's lawyers are both basically looking for as much new information as they can get from the other party. Um, there are many, many things they're asking for, but I think the one that is most substantial and the thing that we're probably watching most closely is Elon Musk's desire to pull in that whistleblower complaint from that former Twitter head of security, uh, Peter Mudge Zatko. Mudge is the name he went by as a hacker. Uh, and that information, which details all sorts of claims on Zatko's part, uh, that Twitter uh, is uh, has a huge spam problem, a bot problem, which is something that Musk has talked about in the past, um, that there are all sorts of data and privacy issues at the company. Um, what Musk is essentially arguing uh, through his lawyers is that they should have the ability to pull that information in, that whistleblower complaint in, and make it part of this uh, fight in the courts. Whether that will be allowed, we don't know yet, but certainly that would open up a whole new world of evidence and take this fight to a whole other level here, Tom. And another big focus today was Musk trying to get Twitter's internal Slack messages and Twitter trying to get Musk's Tesla and SpaceX emails. So how significant is it if these requests are granted? What's the likelihood they're granted? Well, it's a huge, huge issue. You know, for one thing, I mean, if you take Twitter's side of it for a second and look at what they're after, if they get into Elon Musk's communications with SpaceX and Tesla, and this is the big one that they're after, his creditors, right? The thing that Twitter might be able to find there is not only a sort of casual conversation between Musk and somebody in which he might be saying something, and I'm just making this up, this is hypothetical, but, you know, he could be emailing with somebody or slacking with somebody and saying, oh, I never really wanted Twitter, right? That kind of thing would be a huge thing for Twitter to find, but it's also a, a way of finding out whether or not he might have had some difficulty raising the financing that he needs to close this deal with Twitter, which would be a whole other legal issue. So if they did open those things up, it would be enormous. It would also be, I would say, pretty unprecedented in terms of a legal dispute. You don't often see companies that are just sort of thrown open in that way. Um, you know, the, the, at this point, it looks as if the judge is really only going to allow what they call a peak at this kind of stuff. It would be a very limited time frame, so that could be the outcome here, but, uh, you know, it's not likely they're going to be able to see everything they want, but certainly if they see anything like this, it's going to be a huge, huge deal, Tom. All right, real quickly, uh, Musk allegedly wants this move to November, right? So what should we be watching for right now? Well, you know, certainly if that happens, it gives him more time to get into the company's communications. It gives Twitter more time to perhaps get into Musk's communications. But you have to remember here, Tom, the big picture, when you step back from it, this is a guy who signed an agreement to buy Twitter without inspecting the house, right? So that is the fundamental issue here. So all of this other stuff may be second to that when it comes down to it, Tom. He's also a billionaire, a pretty savvy billionaire, and he knows he knew what he was buying, right? If he didn't do due diligence, you got to wonder, what the heck? I mean, you know, didn't he read his own book? Uh, Jake, thank you. we got to move on. But th that was a, just a rhetorical question. Thanks, Jake. Appreciate your time. Let's get you over now to the five things our team thinks that you need to know about. Number one, Liz Truss. You're going to be hearing that name a lot. She is Britain's new prime minister. After meeting with Queen Elizabeth, she is the country's third female prime minister and the 15th person to have the job. Listen to this just during the Queen's reign. The handover took place at the Queen's summer retreat up in Scotland to accommodate her. She is 96 years old and she has some mobility issues, as you would expect. Number two, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommending that some of the youngest children should be vaccinated twice this fall against the flu. This is not a new recommendation, but it is being stressed following two years of the COVID pandemic. The pediatricians say kids aged six months to eight years should would have or who have never received the flu shot. She'll get two this year, one month apart for maximum protection. The recommendation is the same for kids who've only had a single flu shot, by the way. All right, number three, more than half of all minor league players baseball, in baseball, voted to support unionizing, paving the way for an MLBPA membership. The union sent out authorization cards just over a week ago. Minor league players set better working conditions and wages are their top priorities. The MLBPA 
NFLPA is asking for the league to voluntarily recognize their representation. Number four, a new study suggesting that doomsday, the doomsday glacier is disappearing faster than expected. The Journal of Nature Geoscience says the glacier could melt at twice its recent rate, and that could cause sudden rises, increases in sea levels. The glacier is roughly the size of Florida and one of Antarctica's largest. Experts say it could collapse within the next decade. Number five, the iconic Porsche brand is officially going public. It could become one of the world's biggest listings. Volkswagen actually owns Porsche right now. The German company says the IPO could come later this month or in early October. Proceeds from the offering will be used to build more electric vehicles. Coming up, a massive settlement that could have wide-ranging impact. E-cigarette maker Juul will pay states hundreds of millions of dollars. We're going to break down what's behind the agreement and how experts think it could curb teen vaping. And the world's second largest roller coaster will not be offering thrills to anybody anymore. Well, we know about the decision to close it for good and why. That's coming up. We're back, and there is more developing news. E-cigarette company Jewel Labs out with a statement today that its $438 million settlement with dozens of states is a, quote, significant part of its ongoing commitment to resolve issues from the past. The past, they say. The settlement is the result of a two-year investigation by 33 states and Puerto Rico into the company's marketing of its high nicotine vaping products. It marks the end of one of the biggest legal threats against the company. The states found Jewel market its e-cigarettes to underage teens and made misleading claims about the safety and benefits of its products as an alternative to smoking. Juul's legal problems are not over, though. The company still faces nine separate lawsuits from other states and hundreds of personal lawsuits on behalf of teens and others who say they became addicted to the company's products. Dr. Kavita, Kavita Patel joins me now to talk through all of this. Dr. Patel, at least $16 million of the settlement is going to go towards vaping prevention and education efforts. Talk about the impact that Juul has had on teens since it launched back in 2015, only seven years ago, but a profound impact. Yeah, Tom, it's, it's unparalleled because we have had a decrease in youth smoking prior to that with the introduction of Juul, but also other e-flavored cigarettes. That has skyrocketed. And at one point in 2020, Teens were about 16 times more likely to use one of these vaping products than to do anything else. And so that just shows that there was an intense level. And about 12 percent of teens in the last several years have reported using e-cigarettes. And we know that that translates even in never smokers, Tom, to people who then start to smoke what I'll call the more traditional cigarettes that we've gotten used to. That, combined with Juul having as much nicotine as a pack of cigarettes, adds up to incredible devastation in a very young age group. Yeah, and so Juul is also agreeing to stop some of its marketing practices, including, they say, not paying social media influencers and, and putting ads on places like public transportation. But is that going to help, or has the damage already been done? Are people already hooked? Are kids already hooked? Uh, certainly. Look, habits and addiction are hard to break. Uh, taking away the very kind of, you know, cartoons or using youth media influencers, that will help a generation that has not been influenced at this point. But we are talking about millions of teens and countless young adults, Tom. Look, as you mentioned, this has been on the market for seven years. These teens have turned into young adults. Some of them converted into even more smoking, higher nicotine levels than previous. So I think much like we've had to see with the broader cigarette industry or broader nicotine industry, we need to keep track of this and understand the health devastation. Because these products are so new, Tom, we don't have the decades of studies that we do for other more traditional forms of nicotine delivery like cigars or cigarettes. And we need to understand that and we need to hold people accountable for that. She knows everything about everything. Dr. Patel, thank you very much for your expertise. Always good to hear from you. Thank you.
NBC News covers hundreds of stories each day, and because you could not possibly read, watch, or listen to everything, our bureau teams around the country have done it for you and for me. So this is what they tell us is going down in their regions. It's a segment we call the local. From our D.C. Bureau, Maryland's Prince George's County is imposing a curfew on teenagers in an effort to combat a string of violence. The county that borders Washington, D.C., just had its deadliest month in decades. Juvenile arrests have nearly doubled from last year. The curfew if you will be in place for 30 days, it runs from 11.59 p.m. to 5 a.m. Fridays and Saturdays, 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. Sundays through Thursdays. From our Midwest Bureau, Ohio's Cedar Point Amusement Park announced it will be permanently closing the world's second tallest roller coaster. No thank you. Look at that. Uh, top Thrill Dragon, a dragster, has been shut down since at least last August. Uh, that's when a small metal object flew off the ride and hit a woman in the head. She was seriously injured. Cedar Point did not say if the accident influenced that decision. From our Northeast Bureau, a bathroom break gone wrong. The captain of the sailboat went below deck to use the restroom, so he put the controls on autopilot. Well, the system shut off, the boat hit a jetty, got stuck on the sand, lifeguards closed the area, the boat was eventually towed away. The captain says the mess caused him a headache and will now cost him a lot of money, too. After the break, controversial COVID lockdowns in China inside the country's approach to stopping the virus. Back now, and there is some real anger in China. People in the Chengdu area say that they were forced to stay inside during an earthquake that killed at least 65 people. Why? Because of a COVID lockdown. Videos like this are going around showing people locked behind chained gates shouting to be let out. The health commissioner later said that the priority should have been given to safeguarding the lives of the public in the event of earthquakes. There aren't any reports linking deaths from the quake to these restrictions, but people are upset. One comment on the micro-blogging site Weibo says, I guess it's fine if I die inside the building, at least I didn't get infected. The lockdown started last week during the city's 21 million, uh, affecting rather, 21 million people in the city. Because of China's zero COVID policy, lockdowns happen pretty routinely when any virus cases are detected. NBC's Janice Mackie Freyer is in Beijing. Janice, they really have a very different approach uh, there compared to what we have in, in the West. But Chengdu's lockdown is the strictest since Shanghai's earlier this summer. What's it like on the ground there day in and day out, especially after an earthquake? Well, that the after a deadly earthquake killing some 65 people so far uh, would take uh, precedent, uh, would not take precedent over the COVID restrictions just shows how rigid and inflexible the zero COVID policy is here. Uh, it's important to make the distinction that none of the people who died in the earthquake were in Chengdu. So, but it's the fact that people weren't allowed to leave swaying buildings uh, because of these restrictions. 21 million people in the city being told to lock down for another three days. There are multiple rounds of mass testing and real concern growing now uh, that after the panic buying and after uh, a few days of lockdown so far that this could be extended uh, the way it was in Shanghai earlier this summer. Now, Tom, I was just in Chengdu. I, I did 10 days centralized quarantine there with my family after traveling out of China. And we were lucky to make it back to Beijing the day before Chengdu locked down. But because we were coming from what's seen as a high risk area now, we had to do another seven days of quarantine here in Beijing. So it shows how the lockdown and quarantine system is in place all over the country. In Chengdu and in Sichuan, it's considerably worse right now because they're also dealing with drought, the worst heat wave on record, uh, and extreme weather with power cuts. So a really harsh set of circumstances there right now. Uh, and Janice, you know, you talk about how the lockdowns are kind of the way they, they go about managing COVID there, but the global supply chain has taken a serious hit. Oil prices are lower right now because, in fact, demand for oil is lower there in China. Uh, but this is also having a pretty significant economic and business impact. Is there a sense that China might reevaluate uh, its COVID strategy as it relates to the, to the lockdowns? 
In the near term, likely not. I mean, people are restless and, and uh, tired and you know, growing at fatigue for the zero COVID policies. But at least in the near term, uh, the restrictions are only getting tighter. There is the key political meeting here next month, the Communist Party Congress, where Xi Jinping is expected to uh, take on an unprecedented third term in power. So there is the sense that nothing is going to change before then. Uh, and even after after that, it's unclear whether the policies are going to change. Even though they're having an impact on uh, the economy, youth unemployment is rising, schools are back in session now, but kids missed months of classes last year. So could it uh, ease or change after the Congress or even next year? It's possible, but there is the real sense and an and unease with the uncertainty that zero COVID and its vast infrastructure is going going to be a permanent fixture here in China. How much dissent is there or pushback is there from people in China right now? Pushback is only going to go so far when when it's a, a centerpiece public health strategy of an authoritarian government. Uh, people are restless. They can't travel. There, there are domestic restrictions. Passports aren't being renewed. Um, it's difficult to go between cities. You, you have to do quarantine if you want to go from uh, Shanghai to Beijing. So, so people are frustrated. Certainly last year there, there was uh, wide public support for the policies, but that is starting to fade now. We're seeing it online. Uh, people are frustrated. But again, those protests are only going to go so far. NBC's Janice Mackey Freyer, who spends her time, her life in Beijing. Janice, thank you very much. Coming up, call it an American revolution of sorts. Young U.S. tennis stars taking center stage at the U.S. Open. A look ahead to tonight's marquee match and what it could all mean for the sport. So stay with us. It's going to be the Coco Goff show tonight at the U.S. Open. The 18-year-old will be playing in her first quarterfinals, and she's the youngest American to get this far in 13 years. Now, on the men's side, still a lot of buzz after American Francis Tiafoe's upset of number two ranked Rafael Nadal. At 24, he's from Maryland, the youngest American man to make the quarters since 2006. He'll play tomorrow to try to get to the semifinals. So even though big stars like Nadal and Serena Williams have been eliminated, the success of these young Americans is energizing the tournament for a lot of fans. NBC's Ann Thompson, herself a tennis fan, joins us now. So, Ann, uh, how big is tonight for Coco Golf, and is this the chance to pick up that torch now that Serena Williams has kind of said goodbye? Oh, I think it's absolutely huge for Coco Goff. As you said, it's going to be her first time at the quarterfinals at the U.S. Open. And boy, Tom, does she have a tough task ahead of her. She faces Caroline Garcia, who's from France and who has won 12 straight matches. She is absolutely on fire. So it's going to be a real test of Coco Goff's medal. But she's going to have that crowd behind her. They just really love her. And as for following in Serena's footsteps, Coco says she's doing this for herself. She's not trying to be anyone else. She's just trying to be the best Coco Goff she can be. Tom? Don't you? I just, you just love it, don't you? Now, listen, uh, Isla Tomjanovic, who <laughs> beat funny. Serena Williams, just lost her quarterfinal match. She became yeah. a crowd favorite, uh, really, with her grace after she beat Serena last week, right? She really was. And today she was up against her good friend, Ons Jabour, who is from Tunisia. And Jabour beat Il Ilya in um, straight sets, the second set going to a tiebreaker. Um, and Jabour herself is making history. She becomes the first woman from an African nation, she's from Tunisia, to make the semis in the U.S. Open. And she will play the winner of the Coco Goff Caroline Garcia match. Okay, now then you have Francis Tiafo winning against the number two ranked player, Rafael Nadal, last mm -hmm. night. I mean, everybody in Washington, D.C. is buzzing about this because he's a local kid, right? <laughs> a, a lot of firsts in this U.S. Open, especially with American players. So that is changing, one would think, the world of tennis. 
Yeah, you really felt yesterday watching that match between Nadal and TFO that there was sort of this sea change in men's tennis because the big three, Nadal, Federer, who is injured, and Djokovic, who has his vaccine issues, none of the three are in the U.S. Open now. And that sense of TFO stepping up and Kyrgios coming up, you're really seeing the new stars in men ten men's tennis. At least that's what everyone's hoping. Is NBC giving you a press pass to go to these games? I'm hoping. You need to be right there, <laughs> net side, no! I think. do you know? No. No, it's my no, it's my favorite event in New York. It's the best thing New York does is the U.S. Open, and it's great fun whether you're in Ash or you're out on at Louis Armstrong or some of the other courts, just to see how players warm up, how they play. It's fun to be part of the crowd, but no, I did not get lucky enough to get a press pass. <laughs> uh, you should do what I did I need when to I was talk six. To somebody. When I was 18, I uh, I snuck into Wimbledon to see uh, Martina Navratilova play. Didn't have a ticket. I just <laughs> snuck past the cops, and I would, if I were you, I would give that a shot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think and, they might have more forgiveness of an 18-year-old than yeah, me. <laughs> maybe. All right. And thank you. As always, thanks for your reporting. Good to see you. All right. That's a wrap for this hour. We're going to have more for you here tomorrow. Same time, same place. Coverage, though, picks up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.